Hello. In this video I'm going to show you how to improve your painting of buildings in watercolour, a very important part of a landscape. And I've brought you out to this beautiful Peak District village on a nice sunny summer morning and I've already started doing some sketching of this little row of thatched cottages. And before I start putting any detail in, like windows and stonework, I'm just going to establish the sort of perspective. Get a few perspective lines in. Just get the basic structure right before you start on any sort of detail. The thatch on these makes them unusual because you, you're used to looking at angles and fairly sharp corners on buildings, but this thatch just softens it, makes it quite a bit more interesting, but a bit more of a challenge to draw. I've got to make sure I do get those, those right. It's getting quite near to us now, so each of these little gables are getting bigger, a bit more noticeable each time. And remember, it's not an, a neat edge, so we can loosen that up a bit and soften it up. Little things of interest, like where windows are sort of half open, can just add a little bit of interest, a little bit of life to the subject. And I'm going to make sure that I really sketch in with a rich dark, almost a black, for the, for the panes of the windows. And what I do, I tend to sketch the pane in, the pane of glass with the dark behind it. And what you're left with is a bit of white paper that represents the casement. That always looks more realistic than if you actually try drawing the frame itself. And those lines I put in at the beginning of the drawing are really helping me to maintain the correct perspective right the way through it. It's just a glimpse of a little window there. And we'll just put a couple of panes in, that's all you can see. Just indicate these plants and climbers with a few strokes of the pencil. I shall take a photograph to give me some extra information to fill this in before I leave the scene. Important as well with buildings that you, you observe things like the slates and tiles on roofs, but don't draw paint every one of them, just suggest them. I'm using a good 2B pencil, which if I don't press on too much, I can get a fairly thin line, but if I want to get a dark, definite stroke, a real, almost black, then I can do that. And you've got to remember that you start to lose some of these panes now, when you get all the growth around the bottom of them. Now one of the things that attracted me to this scene is the real dark heavy greens of the trees at the back there. They're really sort of acting in a, uh, to create a negative shape that's really throwing forward the shapes of these cottages. And I'm using a graphite stick now, an 8B graphite stick, which puts a lot of shading on quite quickly, just to get the shaping of this big tree here. There's a sort of medium tone here, so if I don't press on quite so much, but that hedgerow through there, and then all the way across this distant part, there's, there's like a woodland that you just get a glimpse of. Don't want too much detail. Now there's just enough detail visible at this right hand side to stop your eye from wandering out of the picture. And now there's some quite darks under the eaves. Got to make the eave look like it does stick out further than the building. And it's casting quite a strong shadow under there. But really all this growth is obscuring a lot of the detail from the downstairs part of the cottage. Which is part of its charm actually. Now there'll be some shadows, because of the lights coming from the right, there'll be some fairly strong shadows across the track. Let's get a strong shadow across the foreground. The beauty of the graphite stick is it really speeds up your sketching. Because it's not as fine a point as a, an ordinary pencil. Strengthen those perspective lines. Now a bit more tone into the stonework here. 
And you can really press on towards the foreground as well. If, the, if these perspective lines coming down this track get slightly thicker and darker as they get nearer to you, then it creates that feeling of distance in the painting. And I think really that's, that's, that's plenty of information in that quick sketch that coupled with a photograph I can take back home to the studio and work up into a, a watercolour painting. For this second demonstration, I've brought us to this very picturesque little Derbyshire village called Ashford in the Water. And there's a lovely church on the main street through the village. I've chosen a church because they're very much an intrinsic part of the English landscape and they can look a bit daunting and a bit complex. So I'm going to show you with this one how you need to start by breaking it down to more simple shapes. And if we look at the church tower, it's basically a large rectangular box. And then about halfway, about a third of the way down the tower comes the roof. And that's where we need to establish a few perspective lines. And we're not going to need all these lines, but they do help us to judge size and shape and perspective early on in the scene. Now there's the roof continues on, it's quite a long building but actually you only glimpse that. It's important to put it in because you do certainly glimpse it, but it's just a glimpse between the, between the trees. I'm not trying to put too much detail in at first, but just enough to give me the information that I'm going to use later on to make it into a painting. And then these trees, these trees are quite an important part of it. They give the scene a, a balance. Important to know that this is higher than the church. If it was the same height, it would spoil the composition. You wouldn't be sure which to look at first, the tree or the church, but this sort of sets the scene. Quite complex, these windows, but I'm breaking them down into simple shapes at first. Just four sections for this window. Another important part of the simplification of the sketch is not to try and include every gravestone. It's often a fault when you're drawing, if you're not careful you tend to look at this window and it's quite an important part of the detail of the church and to overemphasize it make it too big. I want to keep an eye on the scale of it. There isn't quite a bend in the road at that point but I'm going to put one in because that tends to lead your eye back round into the scene rather than leading the viewer out of the picture. And that's often a little technique you can use to keep the viewer's interest in the painting. And it, it, it might not be accurate in terms of the scene, but that's not as important as creating a good painting. I'm going to use a, a broader pencil here. This is a 4B. It's got a much broader lead in it. It fills these spaces in a bit quicker. Keeping that tone quite pale, because that's quite a distance away now. That's way in, way in the background. and it's worth suggesting one or two little details like keystones on the edge of the on the corners of the building don't fall into the trap of trying to draw every stone in the wall just just suggest them now there's some really large dark green trees at the back of the church and at the back of the churchyard itself and if i get those rendered in with a really dark graphite almost a black then I'll leave some shapes out in negative to represent the gravestones. That will really push those forward and give them some life. Blocking in at first, pressing on quite hard into the paper, and then we can loosen up the edge with the point of the graphite stick when we've got the basic shape in. Now, the light puts this front edge of the church into shadow. So just with a sort of medium tone, I'll sketch that in. Leaving a bit of light at the side of the window to look like it's just catching the edge. Now, it's shadows that make a thing look, it starts to bring it to life now. 
makes it three dimensional. And put a bit of tone in for the grass, for the churchyard beyond the wall. And that brings, and again, we're painting in, we're sketching in negative. So the, the tone that I put in behind throws forward the shape of the wall. And I think we'll just put some more, some of these gravestones in in a slightly darker colour and leave some lighter. So we've got a bit of variation. And I think that is plenty of information to take back with us to the studio. For this painting you will need tubes of watercolour paint in the following colours Cobalt Blue, Ultramarine Blue, Oriolin, Raw Sienna and Lemon Yellow, Burnt Sienna, Cobalt Violet, Viridian and Naples Yellow. You'll also need an extra large oval wash brush and four round brushes a number 3, 6, 12 and 16. Well, from the sketch and the photographs that we took out on location, I've now done a simplified line drawing directly onto my watercolour paper, ready to paint on top of. So I'm going to start now by mixing some colours for the sky to put some nice washes in for the background. So I'm going to start with a nice glow for the background. That's some raw sienna with a little bit of burnt sienna. I'm now going to take some cobalt blue and cobalt violet. You don't want too much cobalt violet or, or it'll go too purple. It just warms the cobalt blue slightly. Then I'm just going to start with the same mixture again for this third colour. And then I'm going to make that into a nice warm grey with the addition of a bit of burnt sienna. Well that's the three colours prepared for the sky. I'm now going to take a large wash brush and put a layer of clean water right across the sky area. I'm just dropping that down to where I've put some masking fluid around the top of the building to preserve the shapes of the chimneys and the rooftops. Starting with the yellowy glow in the bottom of the sky, just lay that colour in. Using the side of the brush so I put plenty of colour down. Now the mixture of cobalt blue and cobalt violet. And then the final colour that grey mix. Well now that that's dry we'll look at the next stage. We're not quite ready to start painting the buildings yet. We're still sort of setting the scene and putting in a backdrop. And there's quite a few trees and bushes, some further away and some coming more towards the foreground and the middle distance. I'm going to paint all these trees wet in wet so it's very important that I have all the colours ready. I'm going to start with some green. I'm going to take some Oriolin with just a touch of cobalt blue. I want a bit of lemon yellow, just slightly watered down and then I want a rich dark green and for that I'm going to use Viridian. Now that's a very strong green, like an emerald colour but it's a good base for dark greens and I'm going to add some ultramarine blue to it and then calm it down with some burnt sienna. And one other colour, raw sienna and burnt sienna, just to add a bit of warmth and variety into it. Right, now these colours are ready, let's have a look at the trees. Starting with this cool grey for the more distant ones, I'm just using the side of the brush to catch the paper so I get a sort of broken, uneven effect. We're ready now to start painting some of the stonework on the cottage walls. If you look at the stonework on this cottage, there's, there's pinks, reds, browns, greys, a little bit of blue reflected from the sky. And in order to make it look varied and interesting, we need to get a few of these colours mixed ready to use. I'm going to start with a bit of Naples yellow. This is a lovely creamy yellow colour. 
and I'm adding to that Naples yellow a little bit of cobalt violet to create a sort of warm pink colour. Now a nice stone colour made from raw sienna and burnt sienna and if you remember that was the first colour again that we used in the sky and this will give the picture some harmony because these colours are occurring again in the stonework. Now a touch of cobalt blue with a little bit of cobalt violet and I'm going to put a little touch of burnt sienna into that to make it into a grey. Okay so I'm going to start with that slight pinky colour and paint it over the stonework on all of the buildings. Where the windows are painted with white paint I'm leaving a little white space to represent the window. I'm just going to soften that with a bit of clear water so it stays moist. Then I'm taking the raw sienna and burnt sienna and dropping that in. I want these colours to drift in with each other and merge on the paper. You get far more interesting results if you let these colours mix on the paper than if you try mixing too many of them together in the palette. A bit of that grey. It's quite nice at this stage to just let yourself free with your brush and just drop these colours in rather than looking at exactly where they are on your photograph. I mean I don't think there's any problem in working from photographs but it is a mistake to follow them too slavishly. A good idea to create a bit of texture on your paper can be to use a little bit of kitchen roll and dab it in one or two places to lift a bit of paint off. Now straight away while this background's still damp I'm going to start putting in these other greens and yellows to sort of get the impression of the weeds and foliage and the climbers growing up the walls. Taking advantage of the damp background. So I've got to work fairly quickly. I'm not trying to copy all the shapes of the plants in this painting at all. I'm just trying to get an approximation, a sort of impression of it if you like, just to sort of get the basics in place. Now finally on this stage I'm just going to put a thin wash over the whole of the path area. I'm going to wet the whole area first with clean water. I'm trying to leave a little strip of white paper to look like the light's catching the path as it goes round the bend and out of the picture. Now adding that wash in. And then warm the wash slightly with some raw sienna and burnt sienna at the place nearest to the viewer, right in the foreground. It can help just to define these edges while the path's still wet so they don't look too neat and tidy almost as though they've been trimmed just by dropping it in to the edge there while the path is still wet. So that the path looks like it's reflecting a bit of colour from the sky I'm just going to take a little bit of cobalt blue and cobalt violet and drop that in as well. Well now that we've got all the basic background washers in place both for the foliage and the cottage and the path, all of it really, we can now start to develop the building by sharpening it up with a bit of detail. But we'll start now by mixing a bit more stone colour and try to suggest a few shapes of stones in the wall. And I've got to be careful when I do this that I just pick out a few stones. It's easy to get into the trap, especially if you're enjoying it, of sort of putting every stone in. Now a fairly strong dark brown with cobalt blue and burnt sienna. And we'll start to do a little bit of detailing around the tops of these chimneys. Make them stand out from the colours behind them. Now I'm going to take some ultramarine blue and burnt sienna to mix a nice rich dark brown. And let's look at this area where there's some really strong dark shadows under the eave. I don't want this line to be too neat and tidy. On an old thatched cottage like this we don't want a, a really neat roof line. 
And then I'm going to mix some shadow colour. Very important when you're mixing shadow colour that you mix it from some of the same elements in the sky. So I'm going to take that cobalt blue and cobalt violet and get a quite deep shadow colour there underneath that eave. So it looks like the roof sticks out further than the wall of the building. And then with a, a brush of clear water, we can just soften that at that point. And this not only serves to represent the shadow area of that foliage, but the dark there helps to pick out the edge of the roof of that little porch. I'm going to look at putting some more shadows in now, looking at a definite light and dark side to the building so they look like solid three-dimensional objects. I'm going to make the shadow wash a little bit stronger now so that as the shadows get nearer to the foreground they become more intense, more noticeable. And then let's drop some lemon yellow in for a bit of this foliage, bringing it all down to the top of this gateway. Again working quickly so that I can drop this into the slightly damp background. And there's quite a few heads of little flowers in this dark area here next to the window. And I'm going to continue now with some really dark paint, some burnt sienna and ultramarine blue to mix a rich dark brown. I'm going to use a fine detail brush, something like a number three, to paint things like the window panes, the edge of the guttering, downpipes, little bits of detail on the building like that. When, with the building as far away as this one here, the windows are very much side on and they're just a little slit in the wall really. And I'm going to keep progressing now from the middle distance to the foreground, putting in these window frames. And when I paint a window like this, I'm not painting the frame, I'm putting in the dark colour behind the window pane inside the cottage. And what we're left with, the bit of white paper we're left with, surrounded by the stone colour, becomes the casement or frame of the window. And then we can just emphasise how the foliage is creeping around the bottom of this window frame. A bit of lemon yellow in here, let it drift amongst the dark. I'll use the side of the brush to create a little bit of dry brushwork here. Paint needs to be fairly thick for this. Now a little bit more dark brown and let's make this window frame look like it's set back. Perhaps just a little touch of, of shadow in there. Okay, now again with this little one, just further into the picture here, I think we need a bit of shadow again to make that look more set back in the frame. And then I can work with some of this dark colour. This, this is cobalt blue and burnt sienna to just pick out one or two more bits of mortar between the stones, where it goes round the corner there and disappears amongst the greenery in the shadow. I think we could pick out a few edges of tiles along this roof. These are helping the perspective as well, all these lines follow the perspective lines. A little bit of warmth onto the side of the chimneys, into the shadow. And then there's those little chimney pots over there. I'll take a little bit of raw sienna and burnt sienna. And that's the beauty of the masking fluid. I've left a nice white area which I can just drop that, that colour onto. Well, now we'll look at this thatched roof. An important consideration here, and this is often the case when you're working from photographs, don't just look at that area of your image and think, what colour shall I mix for that? Think about the colours you've used already. You almost don't need to consult the photograph. We'll start with some of the sky colour again. Cobalt blue and cobalt violet. And we'll make a slightly greyer version of that, just like we did in the sky, by adding some burnt sienna. Some of that warm colour from the stone. This will help to look a bit like straw as well in the thatch. 
raw sienna and burnt sienna. Now there's quite a lot of moss growing amongst this old thatch. So we'll take a bit of lemon yellow and we'll take some oriolin and cobalt blue to mix a nice green. Now so that these colours are allowed to merge on the paper and, and mix in and form new colours, I'm going to wet the whole of the roof area with clear water. And start by dropping in some of the raw sienna and burnt sienna. Well worth wetting it first because it just makes it a lot more fluid and allows the colours to mix. Gives you a bit longer to work on it as well. Now some of that sky colour. Try and make your brush strokes at this point follow the slope and angle of the roof. So it emphasises the shape. Now the greyer version of that. Getting that more at the top so it starts to pick out the top of the roof against the sky. And then there's this bit of moss and lichen growing on the roof so we'll add a, we'll add a touch of green into it. Not too much, it wants to be a hint really that. And maybe a, just a touch of lemon yellow where the creeper has joined up with the roof. Bit of that darker green, the Viridian, Ultramarine Blue and Burnt Sienna. Again using the point of the brush to pick out a few leaf shapes. Now with a bit more brown colour created with Cobalt Blue and Burnt Sienna. We'll look at this area here where there's a slight bit of Shadow. Still working onto that soft background so it merges in. Same thing has happened here. Let's make it slightly warmer there with a bit more burnt sienna in it. Just that bit of shadow there at that right hand side of the arch in the roof. Now a bit more of the grey for the top to pick out some of the shape in the top of the roof. Okay now some more of that colour from the roof. From the sky rather. Cobalt blue and cobalt violet. And we'll paint that onto this little porch way here. Again, so it's reflecting the colour on the sky. Such as the raw sienna and burnt sienna. Try and leave a little bit of white paper at a point like this to look like the light sparkling off the tiles. We've got some quite strong trees at this left hand side. So I'm going to just use some of the shadow colour. Firstly amongst the foliage itself and then bring it down onto the path, casting some shadows, pointing you almost, pointing the viewer towards the buildings. Sort of a dappled shadow, breaking up the shapes. Well really it's just a matter of a few finishing touches now, remembering all the time not to get carried away and put too much detail in. And really we don't want to overwork it, so I think that's that for that painting. The four key points to this painting are firstly, use a ruler to determine the scale, the ratio of the width to the height of the buildings, but not to rule lines. You don't want your building to look too neat and tidy. Use your background details like trees and bushes and sky to define the edges of the buildings and bring them forward. Put enough detail in to make it convincing, but don't overwork it. And finally, when it comes to the windows, use a rich dark brown to paint the panes of the glass and the little bit of white paper you should leave represents the frames. For this painting you'll need cobalt blue, ultramarine blue and cerulean blue, raw sienna and burnt sienna, oriolin, rose madder, naples yellow and viridian. In brushes you'll need a one and a half inch flat and round brushes numbers 3, 6, 12, 16 and 20 and you'll also need a rigger. I've had to use quite a bit of extra masking fluid on this one because there are a lot of gravestones in the churchyard that I need to keep white paper till later on when I'm ready to put a bit of colour on. 
Now, first of all, let's mix some colours for the sky. I'm going to start with a wash of cobalt blue. And I'm going to make that a slightly warmer blue by adding a little touch of ultramarine to it. Then I'm going to take another wash of cobalt blue, quite, quite a bit thinner this time. And I'm going to make this blue a little bit cooler by adding some cerulean blue. Okay, now that those colours are ready, I'm going to take a large flat wash brush and coat the whole of the sky area with clean water. As I said earlier, because of the masking fluid, I don't have to worry about painting carefully around the church tower. I'm now going to take a number 20 round brush and starting with the mixture of cobalt blue and ultramarine blue, lay this in at the top of the sky. And when I get about a third of the way down, I'm transferring to the cobalt blue and cerulean blue. The cooler blue. I'm going to try and now form some clouds on the paper using a piece of screwed up tissue paper. You have to do this straight away while the wash is still wet so that, it, so that the tissue will absorb some of the colour and lift it out. Well now that that first stage of the sky is dry, I'm going to mix a colour to put in a little bit of cloud shadow. And that's going to be cerulean blue with just a touch of rose madder in it. Creates a lovely warm grey. Okay, now I'm going to thoroughly wash the brush. And this is a number 12 brush. And into the cloud shapes, I'm just going to put some clear water. And then straight away, before that has a chance to dry, drop that, that warm grey into there. So it just softens into that clear water. And where you get a hard line, just soften that in. Now I'm just going to take some Viridian and Cerulean Blue and then a bit of Burnt Sienna into that because we're going to paint these distant trees over at the left hand side of the church. If the paper's a bit damp it could give us that soft foliage effect because these are distant, they want to be slightly misty because they're further away and then drop in that green. And that's it for that stage. Well, now that the background's dry, I've got rid of the masking fluid from the church and this little building on the left-hand side. But for the moment, I'm leaving it on the gravestones. So we'll now mix some colour for the walls of the church. I'm going to take some Naples yellow with a little touch of burnt sienna. That will warm the Naples yellow slightly. And I'm going to use that colour with a number 12 brush over the whole of the church. Now to try and create a, a warm pink, some of the reflections in the sky, I'm just adding to that mix a little bit of rose madder and I'm just going to drop that in in one or two places. Now while that's drying, we'll mix some colours for this large tree on the right hand side. I'm going to take some Oriolin and Cobalt Blue. Plenty of Oriolin in it so it's a nice bright green. And then I want a rich dark green. And again, I'm going to use this mixture of Viridian with Ultramarine Blue, which creates this rich sort of turquoise colour, which we can then calm down with Burnt Sienna. I'm starting with the lighter green mixture. And I'm going to use the side of the brush so that I can lay it on the paper and get that hit and miss effect created by the rough texture of the watercolour paper. And then with a good brush full of the dark green, I want that to merge in. Now as we get down to the bottom of this foliage, it gets a lot more dense, so there aren't the gaps now. And again we can see the value of putting all that masking fluid along the gra these gravestones so that I can paint it quite quickly with a large brush. Now with a very fine brush, a rigger, I'm just going to take a mixture of Burnt Sienna and Ultramarine Blue 
and then picking some of the little gaps in the foliage let's get an indication of a few branches just to give the trees a bit of structure keeping these lines very thin especially towards the top of the tree where you just get a glimpse of the branches okay and we'll leave that section to dry well let's look now at putting a little bit of detail into the church I'm going to mix a little bit of burnt sienna and cobalt blue to give me a sort of mid-brown colour and the very top of the church is quite darker in colour due to weathering so I'm going to try and do that with this number six brush almost by dry brushwork by dragging it across then I'm going to thin that paint down a bit more and then create just a, a bit more dry brushwork the stones are quite small at this distance so I'm just going to try and suggest them with this hit and miss effect using the texture of the paper your brush needs to be fairly dry and think about the direction of the brush strokes as well they need to follow the perspective lines and now with a very fine brush a number three I'm going to mix some ultramarine blue and burnt sienna to mix a fairly strong brown and start giving the building some detail so we'll look at the top, there's these little spires on the top. You don't need to paint them with too much detail, just indicate them. Getting very fine towards the top of them, almost just a touch of the brush for the point of those. Now to start some fine lines. Keeping in mind the perspective all the time. When you're making fine lines with a little brush like this, even though the brush has got a very good point to it, it won't work if it's flooded with paint. It needs to be fairly dry. So it just drags across the paper. Now I've got a bit of raw sienna, Naples yellow and a little bit of rose madder because these keystones on the edge of the church are a slightly warmer colour. I'm not going to put every one in, I'm just going to suggest them. The little observations you need to make are things like the colour is much darker at the top of the church tower than it is lower down. in the stonework round the windows and that may be a little bit strong so I'm just going to dab it to take some of the colour out now there's quite a, a dark colour in this entrance way in this archway here so I'm getting some more of that dark brown and just placing this this archway in here behind this gravestone and then using that dark colour again we'll now look at the rest of the windows and it's about simplification just looking at the basic shape of them Same for these ones on the side of the tower. Well, now that that stage is dry, I'm going to put some of the roof colour on. Again, I want it to reflect the colour in the sky, so I'm going to take some of that cerulean blue and rose madder. And for a bit of warmth, a little bit of raw sienna and burnt sienna. drop that straight in before the first colour dries try and make the brush strokes follow the slope of the roof and we will have to go back into the roof when it's dry to put a bit of dry brush work in 
Now, while I've got that shadow color mixed, we'll use some of it to put shadows onto the church itself. And remember, the light's coming from the right, so this front edge of the church is going to be in shadow. These shadows should start to give the building some form. This section here is quite important to make it look like this side of the church sticks out further than the tower. And there's quite a bit of shadow, dappled shadow, from this big tree right across there. Almost covering that porch up. I'm going to take now a bit of cobalt blue and rose madder, which gives me a slightly warmer grey, more of a purple. And put a bit of this into the top area here. It darkens it against the sky. And now we'll mix some more green and look at these trees to the left of the church. I'm going to take some Oriolin and Cobalt Blue again. Again, not too much blue in it. Bit of dry brush work again. And we can bring that all along there. And again, behind those gravestones, which you can see, I've still got the masking fluid on. And over at the left side of this foliage, that's where I want the darker colour in. And again, use dry brushwork just to sort of feather it out. OK, now I think the next stage is to get rid of the masking fluid from the gravestones. But of course, we must let these colours dry first. So now we'll mix some colour to put on the gravestones. I'm going to start with some more of that uh, warm grey mixture with cerulean blue and rose madder. And there's quite a lot of a sort of browny green on the gravestones. So I'm using Oriolin and Cobalt Blue with a bit of Burnt Sienna added to it. This is where you get moss and lichen on the stone. I've got a number six brush with a good point to it. And I'm going to try on each of these to leave a little thin strip of white paper to look like the light catching the right hand side of the stone. And before that dries, I'll just drop a bit of that green in at the top and let it drift down. Maybe a little hint of warmth as well with some of that raw sienna and burnt sienna. Now I'm going to carry on using the same method for all of them. Now I'm going to now put a wash, a stone coloured wash over the wall, the pavement and the road, right the way across the foreground of the picture. And I can use a large brush for this, a number 16 brush. And I'm going to try and leave a little strip of white paper right at the top of the wall, a tiny little line of white paper to look like the light's catching it. A large brush this, but it's got a very good point, so I can still put some fairly detailed work in with it. Bringing those washers right down from the wall onto the road. I'll add a bit of water so that I can get more wet in wet. Bringing that right down to the foreground. And then so that it looks like the road reflects a bit of the colour from the sky, I'm going to take some cobalt blue and rose madder. And while this wash is still wet, work that in. So now let's put a bit more detail in for this little shed on the left hand side of the scene. Uh, and I want to take advantage of the fact that this is a man-made object, it's got paint on it. So it's a good opportunity to put a different colour in. And then using that same stone colour, let's hint at a few stones. And now, still continue with these stone colours, we'll, put, we'll try and put a little bit of detailing into the dry stone wall. And when you paint, uh, paint landscapes, dry stone walls are as much a part of buildings as any other. And it's, it's a good idea to think about how you're going to treat them. Unlike a, a wall of a building that is made of dressed stone, a dry stone wall has to look a lot more irregular and haphazard. So these marks I'm putting in 
don't follow a regular pattern. They're a bit haphazard and random. And as I do them, we'll gradually build up a sort of impression of a dry stone wall. But again, like any other building, it shouldn't be over detailed. Well, there's very little to do now to finish this. Just a couple of things I've noticed need doing. I've, I've lost the roof line a bit further down here. So I'm just going to use a, a fine brush with some dark brown to get that. And there's a little cross shape on the edge of the roof here. I'm just going to put in as well. Little details, just little finishing, finishing touches. Now, looking back at this area at the left hand side, I'm going to get a little bit of dark green paint. I'm going to add a bit of cerulean blue to it so I get more of that cooler green I used in the background right in the first instance. And then try and bring back that, that little shape, that roof of the church there. And I think a few perspective lines again to lead your eye along this road into the picture. Again, these perspective lines can help with the shape of the scene. The road twists round at this point here. And there's a little grass verge in here, so I'm gonna take some lemon yellow Paint this onto here. Then some of that medium green. Letting them merge in together. Finishing that off with a dark green, which brings it really sort of forward. It's important now that I let that dry before a couple of finishing touches with some shadows. We need some shadows now, pretty much like the last one. Some shadows cast across the road in the middle distance and across the road in the foreground. And these are cast by things that, that aren't even in the painting. Remember that when you choose a scene for a landscape, that you, that there are other, you're just taking a, one small part of the landscape. There are other aspects from outside which are making an influence and casting shadows into the picture. So I'm mixing some cobalt blue and rose madder. Okay, so let's bring them across the road like that, across the path and onto the wall. Imagine there's some, there aren't actually, but imagine there's some large trees. And even though they're not there, I'm making that up because it just adds a little bit of realism to the scene. And it describes, it's using, I'm using these shadows to describe the shape of the, the road. Now I'm going to strengthen that colour up a little bit. And then we'll get a bit of shadow right across the foreground, across the grass. And way across the foreground, just to sort of really plant that at the bottom part of the picture, right in the, in the foreground where the viewers stood. Just drop a bit of burnt sienna into the shadow mix and use that right at the front to sort of warm the shadow at the part nearest to the foreground. Remember all the time that warm colours come forward and cool colours recede. So that's, that's this one finished. The four key points to this painting are firstly simplify the architecture. It can look quite complex on a building like a church so you do need to be able to simplify it. Secondly, shadows create that three-dimensional look and can really help if you exaggerate them a bit. Make careful use of masking fluid for small shapes you need to preserve. And you can use a bit of opaque colour mixed with watercolour to put light details back into dark areas. I hope you've enjoyed this video and it's given you the confidence to tackle buildings. We've looked at very different types of buildings, but we've applied pretty much the same sort of approach to each one. We've looked at simplification to get the shapes down correctly. And we've looked at how perspective can affect the scene. So happy painting.